Brother Ren? So welcome right. to the STARS uh, a presentation for February 2024. We have John Fortune, W6MBC, designing Bone Brew Yaggies is easy with, with a simple example. So let's see if we can get this audio working. Take your way, John. Okay, guys. Well, pleasure to be with you here today. Let me uh, close this little thing down here so we can see it. This has uh, been an interesting project. As some of you may know, I write quite frequently for QST and also for the Newbie magazine on the air. And I've gotten to know the editor of both of those quite well, Rebecca Schoenfeld, uh, there since she took over from Steve Ford, who was the previous editor of QST. And we meet quite regularly and discuss articles. And this was a, an, an article that uh, we did recently, which was out in the uh, a recent issue of On the Air magazine, which is the Newbie magazine, which I, I do enjoy writing for the that magazine in particular, since I have a great uh, desire to help new hams and have for many, many years. So and this was a, a they, they like to uh, have articles for new hams and uh, help them out. And this is a, and this was a topic that uh, is near and dear to my heart. And it's gotten a lot of compliments uh, from people back at the recent uh, annual uh, dinner for the uh, board members. Uh, that was a topic of interest and uh, received several compliments. This particular particular one was in the last issue. If you want to read more about it uh, in detail, it's in that particular issue of the On the Air Newbie magazine. Okay, let me uh, get back here on the screen. We all know, of course, Yagi antennas, invented in 1926 by these two uh, very uh, Japanese engineers, Yagi and Yuda. Interestingly, the, even though the antenna has got Yagi's name on it, he didn't invent it. It was Yuda that really invented it, the guy on the left. It, but why does Yagi have his name on it? Well, he was the one that sort of uh, advanced it, published on it, and uh, popularized it, where its inventor Yuda there on the left was the one that pretty much designed it. And I guess there's their original, one of their original Yagis there. They were both working it. <laughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Tohoku University in 1926. We of course are familiar with Yagis. Yagis have become a mainstay of the of the radio world. Probably even non hams uh, associate this shape with radio antennas, uh, along with of course the classical radio tower uh, as also as a classical shape, two iconic shapes of, of antennas, even in common people's minds. We're all familiar with them, the arrow beam there on the left, satellites, UHF beams and VHF beams, and of course, <clears throat> our big HF beams, which you see on the upper right, they're all Yagis, Yagi Uta antennas. Now, most of us know how they work to a degree. But just a little review here, and it's not so much just because I'm trying to teach you how you work. Some of you already know kind of how they work. But I found these couple of graphics uh, rather rather interesting, and they, they make it a little more plainer. Just something I like to do. I like to make things plain. That's kind of one of my interests. And I found these this in the next graphic kind of interesting, and it'll help you uh, understand maybe the way a, a Yagi works a little bit better than you have before. They work by what's called parasitic re-radiation, as you can see here in this particular slide. It's the name of the process that Yagi and Yuda developed. Whereas if you take a, a dipole, the green element in the middle, which is called a, which as you know, is called the driven element in a Yagi, where the energy is put in. If you bring another dipole uh, like the driven element, not connected to it in any way, just just near it, it will pick up some of the energy coming off of the uh, driven element just by parasitic or just it being in the field of the driven element will absorb some of the energy. And as anything you bring into the field will do, but if it's, if it's a dipole uh, of similar shape, it's going to pick it up even more. But if it's a little bit difference in length, when it re-radiates the energy it picked up, as you can see there in the blue line, 
it will re-radiate re at slightly difference in time or in phase compared to the wave that is that is coming off of the driven element of the primary. And you can see the two waves, the primary wave in green coming off the driven element and the received and re-radiated wave coming, coming off of the parasitic element, in this case, a director, as they're called in a Yagi, in this case, which is shorter. And because it's shorter, the phase of the radiated wave is as shown. If it were longer, the phase would be different. But by placing it at the right distance, this is the principle of the Yagi, make it the right length and the right distance away from the driven element, and on one side of it, the waves will be in phase, and on the other side of it, they'll be out of phase. We call it on the right constructive radiation, and on the left destructive radiation. On the left, they will tend to cancel, and on the right, they will tend to augment. And they call it the right, the right direction, the forward direction <coughs> of the Aggie, and the rever. <coughs> wow, the frog is really getting me. Uh, here. And, and of course, most of you know this basic principle. That's how the director works. The same thing works if you put if you put another, if you put the element on the other side, but you make it a little longer to change the relationship of when the wave gets re-radiated. But you can establish the same relationship here by making it a little longer, but putting it on the other side and you make it into a reflector. And now, but you still get the same relationship. Now the phase of the re-radiated weight has been shifted due to the change of length. And at the right distance, you can get the same, the same augmentation to occur in the forward direction and the same destructive uh, radiation to occur in the reverse direction or the cancellation. And you can combine these together by, by adding more elements and getting more and more gain by using the same process. Next, I'm going to show you an animation of this process taking place. I found this not so long ago, and I thought it was an excellent animation of how the whole process works. You can kind of see it and visualize it. I like this. I like this little uh, this little animated GIF. You can see the waves being emitted from the from the driven element in the middle, and adding to or subtracting from the. Uh, subtracting from the waves being re-emitted re from the directors, the reflectors. And by the way, if when you're building a Yagi, you want to get more gain, always use more directors. There's very little advantage in using more reflectors. Occasionally you'll see a Yagi with more reflectors, but one is all you really need. It's a waste of time to use more, more than one reflector. And uh, but I thought this was a nice little uh, a little uh, illustration of constructive interference uh, in the forward direction. They're in phase and destructive interference on the back side where they all they all get mixed up and they all cancel out. That's why the Yagi produces little radiation in the reverse direction and produces a lot of radiation in the forward direction. And if you want to add more directors, you'll get even more action this way. OK. But interestingly, from 1926 until 1948, which is right after the Second World War, even professional radio engineers didn't, didn't have a good idea about how to design Yaggies. They mostly designed them by trial and error. They didn't know how long to make those elements and where to place them. It was pretty, less, pretty much by trial and error. They got it done. but it wasn't very easy for them. It wasn't until 1948 that it finally got pretty well quantified. I'm going to show you how it got quantified. But even to this day, there still are no simple rules, particularly for hams, on how you can just go out in your garage and design yourself a Yagi. Most hams don't think they can do that. That's not true, as I'm going to show you here today. There are simple rules. And hams, like this guy on the left, I hope, hopefully that's not you, but uh, we'll, we'll assume it is. Most hams, and even some engineers, are afraid of Yaggies because they think 
Only high-powered engineers can design Yaggies. I can't possibly design a Yaggy. I'd never even think about trying to design a Yaggy. They're way too complicated. I wouldn't have the slightest idea how long to make those elements, where to place them and where to put them and so forth. They look very, very complicated. Well, yes, they can be if you don't know the simple rules, but there are simple rules. And I'm gonna show you them today, such that once you're done with this lecture, you can go out into your garage with some old coat hangers or whatever it is and build yourself a Yagi without having to go to any of the complicated equations or any of the calculators that are on the internet and just go out in your garage and build yourself a Yagi that'll be at least 98% as good as the very, very best Yagi the very most high powered engineer can build. Well, how did it get quantified? In 1948, the National Bureau of Standards, now called NIST, or the National Institute of Science and Technology, as it's called today, produced a document based on some field test studies they did, both at, um, at Sterling, uh, Virginia, and at Boulder, Colorado, where they decided that the Yagi needed to be understood better. And they did a deep, deep study at both of those places on a real test range. You can see one of their pictures there. And they published this document, this NBS Technical Note 688, which, by the way, you can still get it. Just go on the internet and search for that. NBS Technical Note 688, and you can get that very document. That's just three pages out of my copy. And it's readily available on the internet. NBS Technical Note 688, if you want it. And it'll have all of the graphs that they came up with. Since 1948, the Aggie has been well understood. And all of the graphs and all of the equations are in this report, if you want them. And you can use them if you want. You don't need to, though. Believe me, you don't. This one little graph down here is enough. In fact, you don't even need this little graph. You're going to see the magic sweet spot, the easy three rules to designing a Yagi that any ham can use and design a 98% Yagi uh, with these three little rules that I'm going to show you. So today, however, Yagis are pretty well understood, and there are many online calculators. However, or but, here's the big but in this equation, most of those calculators disagree with each other. If you go online and you want to build yourself a Yagi and you say, I'll go online, and I'll get one of those fancy calculators, and I'll put in the, the, all the, everything they want, and you'll crank it out. If you go down the, the, the internet to the next calculator and put in the same ones, you'll get different numbers. They're, and they don't explain how they do it. And hams are confused. They don't know which of those calculators to use. And I don't, and I don't blame you. I, and I did it. I went through, the, I went through a whole bunch of them here re recently. And there's a considerable amount of confusion in those calculators online. And most hams also. If they go into that report 388, it's much too technical. They can't handle the math and those and those curves in there. But you, fortunately, you don't have to know. You don't have to use either of these. You don't have to use those calculators, and you don't have to use that 388 report. You can do it all in your head very easily and get a perfectly good Yagi. <coughs> but you do need simplification. So I'm going to give you two surprises, and here's the number one surprise. You only need three rules. Learn these rules. Grab them. Stick them in your mental memory. Write them down. Nail them to the wall. Only three rules, and you can design a perfect Yagi without any effort. Make all of your elements two-tenths of a wavelength apart. Don't bother with spacing the elements at different spacings. Don't have some close and some farther, even though you'll see Yaggies with some close and some farther. The difference between those Yaggies will only be a couple of percent, not worth the powder and shot to blow it up. All your elements, that's a simple rule, but it's a, it's a sweet spot rule. Make, make all of your Yaggies equally spaced two-tenths of a wavelength apart. It's a sweet spot. Uh, the, you can look at the graphs in the NBS report, and you'll see 
that that's what it is. It's two tenths of a wavelength. Make all of your wag yaggies equally spaced. Then make all of the directors and the reflectors, whether it be a director or a reflector, make the reflectors 5% longer than the driven element and make all the directors 5% shorter. Don't, sta don't stagger them. Don't taper them. Make them all 5% shorter or 5% longer, depending on whether they're a director or a reflector. So your reflector's 5% longer, and all of your directors are 5% longer. In fact, here's the NBS 288 report. Notice that middle curve there, two-tenths spacing. It's a sweet spot. Yes, there can be other spacings if you want, and they have other they have other sweet spots there, as you can see them. But the 0 0.2 wavelengths, what's 0 0.2 wavelengths? Well, it's about 16 inches on 2 meters, about 12 inches on, on 220, and about 6 inches on 440, but 2 tenths of a wavelength. You know how to calculate a wavelength. I don't have to use most of you to work out that simple math. But if you're not, just ask one of the buddies there in your club about how to calculate wavelength. That's easy enough. 300 divided by frequency converted from metrics to inches. It's easy. Two-tenths of a wavelength is the sweet spot for Yaggies. You're going to say, wait a minute, that's too simple. Wait a minute. It's not too simple, and I'm going to prove it to you. Surprise number two, and this was a big surprise to me. Here are two radiation plots from Easy Neck. I like Easy Neck. I, I, you can use any of the other antenna modeling software if you're not into antenna modeling or if you're into some, I like Easy Neck. I got to use it. It's now, by the way, if you don't know that, the professional model of Easy Neck is all free now. You don't have to pay for it. Just go to easyneck.com and you can download the professional model since Royal Llewellyn retired. He's put the pro model of Easy Neck up there for free. You don't have to pay for it. I originally paid for it. Here are two, here are two uh, looking down at the top or azimuth bird's eye view patterns, radiation patterns of a three element Yagi. What are these two patterns? Well, there are two of them. The red one is the one based on the three simple rules I just gave you. Two tenths wavelength spacing, 5% difference in length for all of the elements. All of the directors are 5% shorter. Any directors you've got, any reflectors you've got are 5% longer. You really only need one of them. That's the red curve. What's the blue curve? The, uh, the blue curve is a composite. I went on the internet, took me about half a day to do this. I went on the internet and I searched for every Yagi calculator I could find. And I put in the same, same exact Yagi, the same exact Yagi, and I ran it and I ran their, and I ran their program. And then I composited the results, put them back into Easy Neck and, and ran the composite. And that's what the composite of the best calculators, all of the calculators that I could find on the internet. And my little three simple rules beat it. Those calculators on the internet aren't worth the powder and shot to blow up compared to those three simple rules. Two tenths spacing, 5% shorter or longer. Nothing more than that. You're going to get a Yagi that's 98% as good as the best designed Yagi that the most high powered engineer can create. It's just that simple. So let's let's take the simple design rules here. Here's how you build a Yagi yourself without any calculators, without any NBS studies, without any equations, without every, any heavy duty mat. Get yourself a boom and mount a driven element on it. A Yagi, I mean, a, a dipole, mount a Yagi on it and feed, uh, not a Yagi, mount a, di a dipole on it and tune it up. Tune up a driven element mounted on a boom, piece of PVC or a piece of metal uh, rod or whatever it is. Mount yourself a driven element on it and tune it up with your antenna analyzer until it's, until it's tuned up two meters, let's say, 39 inch long driven element up there. Then add a reflector and a director. And how are you going to do that? Well, you're going to make the director 5% shorter 
and you're going to make the reflector 5% longer. That's just easy to figure out. Just a little simple math. We'll figure that one out. And you're going to space them two-tenths of a wavelength away from the, from the driven element. Again, that's about 16 inches on two meters. It's about 12 inches on 220. That's about six inches on 440. Uh, but you can figure out what two tenths of wavelength spacing is. And I'm sure if you can't work the math, somebody in your radio club will figure it out for you. Simple enough math. I'll show it to you here in a minute anyway. Then you want to put some kind of matching on your Yagi uh, to get the SWR down because it won't quite match. If you, if you just try to feed this Yagi directly, it'll be pretty close. It'll probably be about two to one. Uh, it'll be pretty close. You could use it there, but you probably want to match it and get the SWR down to uh, lower than that. But uh, but they want to put out some kind of matching on it. Uh, and, uh, and then finally, uh, you want to then trim the, all the elements a little bit until you get the frequency where you want. That's the procedure to build the Aggie. It's very, very simple. Very, very simple. Now, what's the number one and the number two there in, the, in, in steps three and four? You always, when you tune up an antenna, want to tune the SWR first, not second. You always want to tune the SWR first, then tune the frequency. You might think, wait a minute, that sounds backwards to me. I want to tune the frequency first and then the SWR. Nope. Why? Because if you tune the frequency first, the SWR will go all crazy on you. But if you tune the SWR first and then tune the frequency, the SWR won't change much. Now you can do them backwards if you want to, but then you'll have to go back and tweak them all over again if you do the frequency first. Always for any antenna, your big beam, your vertical, your car antenna, whatever it is, tune the SWR first, then tune the frequency. Then you won't have to go back and do much tweaking. If you do it the other way around, tune the frequency first, then you'll have to go back and do it all over again. So that's the whole procedure. Mount a dipole, make the length the uh, the the lengths five percent different. Make the spacing two tenths wavelength. Tune the SWR. Trim the trim the lengths or frequency, and you've got yourself a Yagi. Is that difficult? That's easy. And what will you have when you get done? You will have a Yagi that's at ninety five to ninety eight percent as good as the best Yagi the most high-powered engineer can ever create. It's really that easy, as this uh, very high-powered engineer here uh, is discovering by looking in his book on Yagi Design. My wife found this picture some years ago, and I thought it was so precious that I would uh, oh, oh, I use it quite often. No, this book didn't say Yagi Design on it. I put that on there with Photoshop. <laughs> so... Let's look at some common match methods. I'm gonna give you some examples. There are three common match methods for, for doing Yaggies for homebrew, uh, or maybe otherwise that, uh, and I'll show you the one I like the best, which is the hairpin at the bottom. Uh, but uh, just in case you wanna build yourself a Yaggie, and they're so easy to build, as, as you'll see, as you'll see here. Gamma match, I don't like, it's very difficult. The J match, good match, it's a half a folded dipole and the hairpin, which is the one I like the best because it's the easiest. And I'll give you some examples of it here in the next few slides. So let's build a really cheap Yagi example. And this is the one at the uh, at the director's dinner at the ARRL here recently that, uh, that got a lot of compliments. Let's start with the boom. Okay. Here's what a lot of hams think they should use for the boom to build a homebrew Yagi with a piece of PVC pipe. No, don't do that. Don't go out and buy a piece of PVC pipe to build the boom for a homebrew Yagi. Why? It's really tough to mount the elements on. And, and although I think this particular Yagi probably worked fine, this guy had a lot of difficulty getting the elements mounted. You can see all that electrical tape to try to hold it on there. It worked, of course. And of course it's work, but that's not, that's Mickey Mouse. That's not easy. So don't, don't use PVC pipe to build homebrew Yaggies. That's not the, that's not the way to go. It'll work, of course. And I'm sure this, I'm sure this Yaggy works just fine. By the way, this is the J-match. J-match is a good way to, uh, 
uh, to match a Yagi. What's a what's a J match? That you, you notice it looks like a J pull. That's why it's called a J match. Uh, it's it's using half a half a folded dipole to do the matching. Some of you will know this. Many of you won't know it, but some of you might know this. What's the feed impedance of a J pole of a of a, of a folded dipole? Well, it's about two hundred ohms. If you open up a folded dipole, the feed feed impedance is about is about two hundred ohms. What's the feed impedance of a plain dipole? Well, it's about seventy two ohms. Uh, and in a Yagi, by the loading of the other elements, it comes down. So if the if you just put a simple dipole uh, as the driven element, and in a Yagi like this one, its its natural impedance will be about fifty about twenty five ohms. But if you make half of it into half of a folded dipole, you'll raise the impedance back up closer to what you want. So this common method here of making half of the driven element into a half of a folded dipole, you raise the impedance and you feed it by the by connecting to the middle of the of the straight piece there and then the end of the folded piece there and you'll get an impedance which is pretty close to 50 ohms. That's why this is a common way to feed a homebrew Yagi. Just put the connector right there or solder as this guy has done, just solder directly to the to the main dipole and to the end of the folded end, and you're going to get a match pretty close to 50 ohms. It's a pretty quick way to make a quick match to a to a multi-element Yagi homebrew called the J match. It's a good method. The commercial builders like J like gamma matches. Reason is, and if you're going to build a commercial Yagi, you've got the facility to build J matches. There, sure. I mean gamma matches. They're good matches. They're easy to adjust but they're hard to build. And for home builders, gamma matches are difficult to build. I don't, uh, I don't care that much for, for gamma matches. Also, rectangular booms are very popular for commercial builders. Why? Because they're easy to mount elements in. You can just slip the element through, put a little screw, drill and tap a little screw, and it'll hold the element in right. The popular, uh, popular uh, uh, satellite beam that most of us like to use, uh, uses this method. The arrow beam uses this method. Square booms, but unfortunately, square aluminum tubing is often difficult for hams to get unless you've got a good metals dealer in town. So, uh, so I, I don't, I don't like square. I don't, I don't generally use square metal booms for homebrew yaggies. At least I don't recommend them. I have a good metals dealer and in, in my town, and I can get square metal tubing if I want. But my general recommendation for homebrew quick Yaggies is not to use square metal tubing. It's hard to get. If you've got it, use it. Of course, it's great. But if not, I like something simpler. Here's my recommendation for making a homebrew Yaggy. A simple piece of one by two finished lumber, which you can buy at any lumber yard or usually at any common hardware store these days. It's great. It lasts fine. A little coat of urethane varnish on it, and it'll last for years out in the weather. That's what to build a homebrew Yagi with, not a piece of PVC. They're, it's easy to mount the elements on. You just drill holes through them easily. The elements go, hang in there very easy, a little silicone sealant. Those elements will stay in there just fine. No wrapping with no wrapping with electrical tape or even screws to hold them in. Just put a little silicone glue on it and slip it in. They'll stay in there for years. And you can see here, here's a J-match used in this particular one. I didn't build this beam. This is one I just got off the internet. And you can see the coax has been soldered directly to the uh, the end, to the middle of the dipole and to the end of the J to make the connection. That's a very nicely built, very cheap little beam. And that's fine. I don't like the elements, as you're going to see here in a minute, but the beam is a, an effective little beam. The only thing I disagree with here is using common house wire to build the elements out of. But otherwise, I'm sure this was a very functional beam. He's also tapered the elements, which I don't agree with, but uh, that's all right. Uh, it's still a good beam. I uh, like it's pointed out here for the for the boom. That form of boom is a very good way to make an inexpensive beam, but it'll last you for years if you build one this way. 
Here's an interesting character, Diana Eng. She's shown up a lot on the internet. She's also a very active ham. And here's her one by two beam to, to simulate the arrow beam. It's a 440, 220 crossed uh, beam, which used for satellite work. And she's also a very active ham and has published some very innovative ham designs. She's a, she's a fashion designer in New York City. And that's where she's this picture is taken in New York City there. And she's using also the, the uh, j pole or the J-match. You can see the connectors on the other side of that little block there in the in the middle and the J-match. And she's using aluminum tubing here and uh, also uh, uh, wire wraps to protect your texture from poking your eye out here. But a nice design. Okay, let's look at a really cheap Yagi example. First of all, the elements. <clears throat> what are you going to build the elements out of? What do I recommend? And sorry for the typo there, the semicolon instead of the L. <laughs> Don't build your elements out of these. That's what most hands might think to build the elements for a homebrew Yagi out of, but I don't recommend these as this material. Don't use soft co soft copper tubing or aluminum tubing if you can get it these days, although you can get it at auto parts auto parts store as fuel tubing. And don't use solid house wire, solid copper house wire. Why? These are flimsy. They, well, it builds a flimsy beam. Don't use these materials to build a, to build a Yagi out of. Either either use proper aluminum tubing, or what I'm going to show you here in just a second. House wire like this beam, and I'm sure this beam worked just fine, but that's not a durable beam. The boom is fine, made out of the one by two, but the, the wire is, is flimsy. That's not a flimsy, that's not a durable beam. So don't use house wire to build your, your, your homebrew beam out of. Here's what you should build it out of fiberglass rod. Now, where do you get fiberglass rod? Well, what is this? These are driveway snow markers. If you live in snow country, which you guys do, most of you, or at least partially at least up there in Reno, um, uh, you might, might use these. Uh, certainly anybody that lives in snow country and all knows what these are. These are 5 16 inch diameter fiberglass snow markers, which you can buy relatively inexpensively on the internet. Amazon has them. They're, they're made out of uh, fiberglass and they're very strong and very tough. And uh, relatively, you can buy a whole bundle of 10 of these for 10 or ten dollars or so. And they have a reflective uh, thing on there. You can stick them in the snow to my wife saw me uh, buying these. She said, what are you buying snow markers for? We live on the coast of California, north of Santa Barbara and sound of, south of San Luis. <laughs> no snow here. <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah. She says, I know what you bought them for. You're going to build an antenna out of them. I said, yeah, you're right. You know me well enough. She's a ham, by the way, too. Uh, KF6OEB. Anyway, <laughs> I said, yeah, I'm going to build antennas out. I, I use these for my elements. But you say they're not they're not metallic. Don't worry about it. All you need to realize is skin effect. Skin effect shows that the current in an in an antenna conductor all flows on the surface. There's no current flowing in the middle of an antenna conductor. It all flows on the surface. But you can use fiberglass rods, and here you can also use bicycle flags, which you can buy down at. Uh, down at Wally World, uh, or you can order on the internet. They're quarter-inch fiberglass rods. They work very well, too. And you cover them with aluminum foil, sticky aluminum foil, which you can also get easily on the internet. You just put it down on a piece of carpet, hold it down, put the rod down on it quickly so you don't get it stuck accidentally, and then just give it a roll, and you roll it on and cover it up with self-adhesive aluminum foil tape. Now you've got a conductive rod that's tougher than you know what. Here's the design for the Yagi. Uh, and it's, it's not coming in the on the air, it's in the on the air <laughs> at the moment. And it's been, uh, it's been uh, well done. There's some people in your orbit who are either voting for Donald Trump or considering it, for sure. A lot of my friends are obviously my age, so we're Sorry? That was exciting, John. That's all right. And here's the Aggie. It's very simple. You don't need to, you really don't need these dimensions. 
uh, you can figure them out for yourself. You can you, any most of you should be able to figure out how long to make a driven element. Well, it's about it's about 38 inches or 39 inches. It's going to be a little shorter than that. Uh, and then you make the driven element and the uh, uh, that length, and then you make the director five percent shorter, and you make the reflector five percent longer, and you space them. You make the spacing two tenths of a wavelength, and as you can see it here, which happens to be on two meters, sixteen inches, and uh, and there's the actual actual length length. But as I say, it's in the current issue of the On the Air magazine. Or you can get it from the uh, from the archive at A double R L easily enough. Now the hairpin. How does the hairpin match work? This is the hairpin. It's just a little piece of fourteen gauge solid copper wire, with loops bent into the end. Now anybody can, but just a pair of needle nose pliers can bend one of these very easily out of fourteen gauge wire. I can take a piece of solid copper wire and with a pair of needle nose pliers bend myself one of these in two three minutes it's not a big deal to bend one of them and for this particular yagi that one that i showed you there uh, the dimensions are two by three inches it turns out to be that how do you get there i'm going to show you how you get there you don't have to have any fancy formulas don't ask me for a formula for this hairpin you don't need one how the hairpin works. Okay, here's how the hairpin works. Most of you should know that a dipole, a simple plain dipole, if it's a thin dipole, which of course it is relatively in this case, uh, if a thin dipole out in free space has a center feed impedance of 72 ohms, pretty, not that far from, from uh, 50 ohms. So it would give a match of about one and a half to one. Uh, uh, you could use it there. Uh, it would or two to one, roughly speaking, somewhere in that range. But you'd like to get it down to 50 ohms. If you put a director and a reflector on it, or bring anything else near it, or bring it near the ground, the impedance will drop. But if you put a director and a reflector on it, the impedance will drop. That's true of any dipole that you, you, when you bring anything near it or any antenna that you bring near it, if you bring anything near it, the impedance will drop. In the case of the, the little three element Yagi or pretty much any, any number of element Yagi, it's gonna to drop to about 35 ohms, which is below 50 ohms as you can see. And it's gonna become a little bit capacitive, a little bit capacitive minus J ohms certain number of ohms of capacitive reactants. So it's going to be not, it's not going to be quite purely resistive like you want it to be, pure 50 ohms resistive. So you're going to want to cancel out that negative reactance there that's present due to the bring, adding the director and the reflector. How do you do it? You're going to want to put a little bit of inductance across the feed point of the, uh, of the Yagi to bring it back, bring the feed point impedance back to 50 ohms. And you do that by using a hairpin. What is a hairpin? A hairpin is just a little short piece of open wire transmission line, less than a quarter wavelength long. Now, if any of you know a little bit of transmission line theory, will realize that a, a, uh, a shorted transmission line if it's short, is is inductive. If it's exactly a quarter wavelength line, it's an open. If it's a lo slightly longer than a quarter wavelength, it's capacitive. So a shorted piece of open wire transmission line, which is a hairpin, is an inductor, a coil. That's what it is. Now you could do the same thing by putting a little coil across the uh, across the feed point but it would be difficult to figure out the coil. It's much easier just to use a little hairpin. And that's what that hairpin is. It's just a little coil that you put across the feed point terminals of the Yagi to bring the 35 minus J ohms, that's the capacitive reactance caused by the director and the reflector, to bring it back to 50 ohms. And it does it very slickly. How do you figure out how big to make that hairpin? And you can see here's a picture of the hairpin. 
that I have on uh, on uh, my two meter on that two meter version of the of the Yagi. You can see it. How did I determine the size of that, which is two by three inches, by the way? I just did it by simple ham pragmatism. I just figured, well, it's going to be it's going to be two inches wide because that's how far apart the screws are there in the driven element. That's the driven element with the aluminum foil on it to make it conductive. And by the way, there's a gap. You can't see the gap because it's inside the it's inside the wooden boom. It's a it's a half inch gap or a one inch gap. Just the left length of the gap doesn't matter. I think it's a it's a, I think it's a one inch gap there in the middle of the boom. Uh, I took just took the foil off the uh, for 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 a one inch gap, and then I drilled some holes through the middle of the uh, through the middle of the rod there, using a little uh, the dowel drilling drink jig so I could get the hole straight through the boom. And then there's a 632 screws, three quarter inch 632 screws with some nuts and washers to go through. And uh, and <clears throat> that's what the little loop in the end of the air bit is for to go over the screws. It's also the it's the feed point there where the little ballon hooks up. How did I make that hair pit? I simply started making them. I made one saw what it was looked at my looked at, then looked at my uh, at my match and see how good it was if it wasn't good i made another one how long is it going to take you to make one of those hairpins two or three minutes that's all and i kept, i just made two or three or four of them until i got one that i got a good match with that's all simple ham pragmatism no equations no formulas no fancy song and dances don't ask me for an equation how to make that air pin. Just make one. And if it isn't right, make a longer one or make a shorter one. Use your meter. And if, it's, if one is better, use the better one. Okay. Then I made myself a little ballot. Four turns of common. This is that's mini eight coax, which I like to use instead of RG58. 58 is very lossy coax. Mini eight's much better. And I use four turns is enough for two meters. And, uh, and I just tie wrapped it on there onto the boom, one on top, one on the bottom. Right behind it, I drilled two sets of holes for a U-bolt to hold that on the boom. And I drilled one through horizontally and one through vertically, either for horizontal or vertical mounting of the Yagi. That's between the driven element and the reflector, which is on the left, the directors to the right here in this picture. And there's the finished Yagi. It uh, works, works real great. If you want to, you can run the coax down the inside of the mast if you want. And I used a two inch PVC mast or a nipple, short nipple and mounted the, and later further on down, I could convert it to a metal mast. In fact, this Yagi, this Yagi will mount it directly on a metal mast. If you want to, I just preferred to mount it on a PVC mast. That's a piece of two inch PVC held on and the coax is held on with tie wraps. Or as I say, you can instead feed it up and drop it down the down the PVC mast. That's a great little beam. This is mounted horizontal in case you want to work DX with your two meter beam. Or if you want to work repeaters, you just put the put the U-bolt through the other set of holes and mount the beam up vertically. Other bands, 220, 70 centimeters. I didn't build a 220 beam, but I did build a, a 70 centimeter beam. And here it is. You might be interested to note here that that the U-bolt and the and the uh, ballon, which here is only three turns, and that's enough for 440, and the and the hairpin again, which I I simply shortened it up until I got a good match by making one or two of them until I got a good one, uh, is mounted behind the reflector, and you notice equal spacing, five percent shorter, five percent longer. It's all this all used to design this. I had to move the U-bolt out from between the driven element and the reflector to stop some of the parasitics. It was just it was disturbing the beam. But this this was easy. This little Yagi tuned right up very quickly. If you want to mount it on a metal mast, here's one way. Go down to your 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 TV store or whatever it is and buy one of these double mast clamps, or you can buy them you can buy them right off the internet. Uh, they're easy enough to get from Amazon, or just use a PVC mast all the way. Here's the takeaway then. There are only three spot rules. Memorize them. All elements, I mean 
all elements, not some of them, but all of them. Forget the calculators. Forget any, any, anything you've ever learned about Yagis. Make all of your elements the same distance apart, two tenths of a wavelength. The NIST study proved that that's the sweet spot. All directors and reflectors are all the same. Directors are all directors, 5% shorter than the driven element. All reflectors, if you have more than one, 5% longer. Extra directors, equal length and equal spacing. Simple rules. Anybody can remember them. You can use curtain rods or whatever you want, and you can build perfectly good Yagis with no fancy stuff. Design step, mount a driven element, tune it up, add a reflector and director with the simple rules, match the feed point with, a, with some kind of matching, get the SWR right, then trim all the lengths to frequency, and you've got a perfect Yagi. There's no longer any need to be afraid of Yagis. There is a simple method, and that Yagi proves it. It isn't just high-powered engineers that can design Yagis. You can do it in your home workshop with no high-powered techniques. Here's my little doggy, Lolly. No, she's not D0GGY. I just like to pretend that she is. And here's where you can reach me, w6nbcmail at gmail.com. And that's my website, w6nbc.com. Okay, thank you so much, John. We have some uh, appreciation here at in the stars. Uh, due to our time constraint, um, if they can, if they have any questions, can they just email you? Is that okay? Sure, that's fine. Okay, that would be great. And again, it's w6 November Bravo Charlie Mail dot com or w6 uh, NBC dot com for his uh, website. Anything you want to say in closing, uh, John? That's it. Glad glad to be there. Glad to come back anytime you like. Okay, thanks. So this is the second time we've had John here. Sure, appreciate it. Have a beautiful day on the coast side there in Santa Maria. We're having sun and about 40 degrees here in Reno, but tomorrow is going to be a whole different story. Love the idea of using the uh, the snow stakes. Uh, that will be something that I have. And if I go hiking and snowshoeing, I'm going to be looking at those snow stakes. Thanks so much, John. 73 from Reno. My pleasure. Okay, bye bye. Okay, this completes the. Um, presentation for the SNARS monthly meeting on February the 3rd, 2024. Thank you. And we're just going to stop the recording now.